to sing this one. Sounds like music in my head. shall see in his hands the print of the nail and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side I will not believe and after eight days again his disciples were within and Thomas with them then came Jesus the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. I want to talk today on passionate praise. Passionate praise. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thomas answered unto him and said, My Lord and my God. Very often in the translation of Scripture, one will discover the inadequacy of human language. Perhaps you have discovered, as have I, that in some instances what you read in this book may in fact be somewhat distanced
from what the writer originally intended to convey to the reader. Words can sometimes and somehow get in the way of their meaning. The sensitive interpreter, of course, will understand that what you see with your eye and what you hear with your ear may not at all be what the spirit intuits or what the heart knows. The words I say somehow get in the way. And yet in every instance of sacred scripture, the trouble is never with what God writes. The trouble is always how inadequately we read God's writing. The trouble is never with God speak, but with the inadequacy of the human tongue to interpret what God has to say. Why not take this matter of the inadequacy of human language into account when one reviews the events and the circumstances surrounding the post-resurrection experience of a disciple of Jesus, one Thomas by name. You know this Thomas. The record of his service is recorded here perhaps more fully than any other of the disciples. In fact, Herbert Lockyer says that it is to the credit of John's gospel that Thomas is rescued from permanent obscurity if not oblivion altogether. Thomas was the one they called Didymus. Some have even suggested that they called him Diddy for short. <laughs> Just check it to make sure you were listening. An acknowledgement that Thomas was the one who had a twin. Or it may well be, as one scholar has suggested, that Thomas's real name was Judas, but they gave him Didymus as a nickname in order to distinguish him from Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot. And I do not mean to be redundant, but Thomas was the one they called Didymus. And so I take the interpretive and exegetical latitude to suggest that Thomas was not really a twin biologically, but Thomas was a twin psychologically and emotionally. Thomas was not a twin to anyone else. Thomas was a twin unto himself. Psychologists call it schizophrenic. Some folk call it double-minded. Where I come from, they call it two-faced. Or as they would say, two-faced. But whatever you call it, I take the position that there was not one Thomas, but two Thomases in one man. Uh, in one man, a fearless Thomas and a faithless Thomas. A courageous Thomas and a frightened Thomas. A bold Thomas and a backward Thomas. A fighting Thomas and a cowardly Thomas. A revolutionary Thomas and a retreating Thomas. They called him the twin because there were two men in one man. One day hot, another day cold. One day you could count on him, the next day you couldn't find him. One day in church, the next day out of church. One day present, another day absent. And the question comes, who is this Thomas? Thomas was the one to whom Jesus spoke directly concerning the inevitability of his death. Thomas tried to warn him, the disciples tried to warn him, but Jesus reminded them that except a grain of wheat fall to the earth and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Thomas was the one who, when he understood the plan for death as a part of the ministry of Jesus, spoke to the rest of the disciples that they might not shrink as cowards from the task. 
Thomas was the one who declared, let us also go that we may die with him. Anybody here remember Thomas? Thomas was the one who listened on that night when they celebrated the Passover, when the wine was poured and the bread was broken and when Jesus spoke of the theme of everlasting life. It was then that this word came out, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way you know. But it was Thomas, an incredulous Thomas, who spoke up and said, Lord, we know not whither thou goest and how can we know the way. In other words, we don't know where you're going. We don't have a clue where you're headed. We don't know how you intend to get there. So how can we know the way when we don't even have a road map? But above all else, you know Thomas because of his skepticism and his doubt. You have not forgotten that following Friday's death on a cruel cross and the burial of Jesus in a borrowed grave, Thomas did not join in the shouts of victory. Thomas knew that his life was on the line. And when everybody else showed up as usual for prayer meeting, Thomas was among the missing. Thomas did not join those of blind faith and unthinking enthusiasm. Thomas required more than the testimony of some excited women still worn and breathless from the run back from the graveyard. It was Thomas who declared without flinching, except I see in his hands the print of the nail and put my finger in the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side I will not believe now then you are aware that John says that eight days later the same disciples are in the same room holding the same prayer meeting somebody hear me today I said the same disciples are having the same prayer meeting in the same room there is a difference however and the difference is that in this gathering thomas is present after all they have been through with the frustrations of their calling and the fear they held for their future nevertheless the disciples have come together and this time thomas is with them remember that judas is dead the whereabouts of jesus is uncertain but to their abiding credit, the disciples have come together and Thomas is with them. Do not rush today in the analysis of this text, for John is quite precise in his declaration that Thomas was with them. But he also notes that the door was shut. The disciples had gathered for the purpose of prayer, but while they were praying, the door was shut. The disciples had gathered for the purpose of asking God to come in. Asking God to come into their gathering, but the door was shut. You, I said it three times, you missed it, you, you, you didn't get it. The disciples had gathered for the purpose of praying about Jesus, wanting to know something about Jesus with little expectation that they would ever see Jesus again. And that's why the door was shut. Jesus came to see them, to stand in their circumstance with them, but he had to get through their shut doors in order to be there with them. I wish somebody would pay me a little attention for you go completely to sleep. Maybe, maybe the trouble with prayer meeting is that the door is shut. 
maybe the trouble with our worship is that we have become insulated and isolated because the door is shut maybe the church can't get out and Jesus can't get in because the door is shut maybe Jesus and the Holy Ghost would show up but the door is shut maybe the reason we have difficulty sensing the presence of Jesus in what we call worship is because the door is shut a shut door says stay out an open door says come in a shut door says we're satisfied talking to ourselves but an open door says we need to hear another voice a shut door says we're making do with what we already have but an open door says we live in expectation that something better is yet to come a shut door says we're not looking for anybody else to come but an open door says we expect somebody else to come in and I don't know how you feel about it but when I come to church there ought at least be the expectation that Jesus will come in I said you didn't hear me I said when I come to church there ought to be at least the expectation that Jesus will come in there ought to be an expectation there ought to be an expectation that we are open enough for Jesus to come in there ought to be a welcoming atmosphere that will permit Jesus to come in there should be no reason for Jesus to have to break down barriers and take down doors there ought to be an expectation that he will come in and yet John says that in spite of the shut door Jesus came in pronounced a benediction of peace on their gathering and then spoke directly to Thomas it was as though he came back with the direct intention of speaking personally to Thomas Thomas this is what you asked for so since this is what you asked for this is what you get reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing may I share with you today a parenthetical thought there is something wrong with a religion that does not soil your hands there is something wrong with a religion that requires somebody else to do your work and to do your dying for you there is something wrong with a religion that puts blood on somebody else while you stay clean. What Jesus requires is that you put your hand in it. I said what Jesus requires is that you put your hand in it. This is just a parenthetical thought, but I wanted to tell you that Jesus requires that there be some blood on your hands. And that means you got to put your hand in it. He will not force your hand. You must make a conscious decision to put your hand in it. I thought you needed to know that you cannot stand on the sidelines. You cannot be an unaffected observer. You cannot distance yourself from this church business as something for somebody else to do for you. You cannot hide out in the pews. You cannot escape personally personal involvement you cannot conduct the business of ministry with binoculars and it may be a bloody mess but sooner or later you've got to get involved you've got to be a part of it you got to put your hand in it you will figure out what I'm saying about Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock Thomas come here put your hand in my hand Thomas, come here, put your finger into the place where nails used to be. Thomas, come here, take your hand and put it in the gash, the wound that's in my side. Come here, Thomas, put your hand in the place of my pain. The least you can do is take a handful of leftover blood. Thomas, come here. You got to put your hand in it. And that's the moment when John says, that the response of Thomas was my Lord and my God. And this is also the moment when I suspect that there is an inadequacy of human language. I suspect that here in this instance, the words have gotten in the way of the meaning. Stay with me because we're going somewhere. Here's what I suspect. 
as sensitive and as traumatic as this moment was for the disciples, for Thomas and for Jesus. The Thomas response does not seem sufficient. When you consider the seriousness of the moment, no matter how much you change the inflection, no matter how much you elongate the vowels, the words alone don't seem to convey the magnitude of the moment. Well, excuse me today, but there are just some moments that require something beyond the ordinary. Let that boy holler, he's fine. There are some moments when I've got to do more than nod my head. There are some moments when I am required to say hallelujah. There are, there are some moments when I am obliged to say praise the Lord. There are some moments when it is necessary for me to shout. There are some times when I cannot escape it. I've got to hold up holy hands. I've got to say thank you for myself. There are some moments when what is required is not just pity any praise. It is required that I give God some passionate praise. Let, let me hurriedly suggest that I believe I understand Thomas. I, I understand his reluctance. I understand his intention to be conservative and reserved in his response. I, I understand his unwillingness to be caught up in collective hysteria or any form of groupthink. After all, there were some things that he knew for himself. He didn't need to ask anybody else. He knew it all by himself. He, he saw them beat Jesus all night, Thursday night. He saw them place a planted thorn, crown of thorns upon his head. He saw them remove from his body that seamless robe that he wore. He saw them cast lots for his clothing. But more than that, he saw them nail him to a cross. He saw them nail him hand and feet. He saw the blood and the water gush from his body he heard him give up the ghost he saw him hang his head in the locks of his shoulder he saw Joseph take down his limp and blood drained body wrap it in linen put him in a tomb and then watch soldiers roll a stone in place he saw it for himself no wonder Thomas was incredulous no wonder Thomas nursed his own doubts and fears. Thomas had been through too much. Thomas had had too many hopes that had already come crashing to the ground. Thomas had had too many unverified rumors. Thomas was suspicious that this was just another jack leg preacher trying to fool the folk and stealing in the name of the Lord. But I still believe that in spite of all that what you have here is really an incident of what I call passionate praise. Now this is my argument. There is a level of praise that is present within the words of Thomas that are neither evident nor obvious from a pure reading of the text. When Thomas cries out, my Lord and my God, something else is at work beyond the words. Here's what I've discovered. My praise becomes passionate only in relationship to my pain. I said my praise becomes passionate only in relationship to my pain. That which touches me internally evokes an expression of that pain or relief externally. Let me see if I can get you to understand. If my pain is great, I, I tend to say, ouch. If my pain is great, tears will well up in my eyes. If my pain is great, I can't keep it to myself. And I have to let somebody else know the extent and the depth of the pain that I feel. On the other hand, when I, my pain is relieved, I tend to let out an audible sigh of relief. 
When my pain subsides, I tend to dry my eyes. When my pain eases, I have to say thank you. When my pain lifts, I know how to sing what a friend we have in Jesus. When my burden is easier to bear, I want to tell somebody, listen honey, you don't know what the Lord just done for me. Thomas was about praise. Thomas was about some passionate praise. And my praise is always in relation relationship to my pain let me tell you a thing or two here today you want to praise him then I tell you what just go through something you want to praise him then walk through the valley and the shadow of death you say you want to praise him wait till you're flat on your back you say you want to praise him just wait for some seasons of distress and grief you want to praise him just wait for the hearse wheels to ride down your street Thomas had to praise him because of the pain predicament of his life and that's why I keep trying to tell you that your praise is always in relationship to your pain oh let me just stop right now because y'all are fast asleep is there anybody in here knows anything about pain is there anybody in here that knows anything about what it is to hurt I'm talking about hurting on the inside where nobody can see but when you hurt like that it'll give you something to praise him for when he brings you out on the other side I wish I had a little help in here today It's about passionate praise. But I've discovered this as well. That my praise can only be passionate in relationship to my personal experience. Now follow the text. For more than a week from one Sabbath to the next, the other disciples had tried to convince Thomas of what they had experienced. They tried to convince Thomas of what Mary Magdalene and the other Mary had seen. They recounted conversations that they held. They reviewed the assurances that others had given. And for more than a week, from one Sabbath to the next, everybody tried to entice Thomas into affirming what they knew. But Thomas had no testimony. Thomas had not seen Jesus. Thomas had not heard from Jesus. And every sensibility he had said that whatever went to the cemetery stayed in the cemetery. All he knew was that whatever died remained dead. Well, I tell you what, ask any two-bit lawyer and they'll tell you that your testimony only has value in relationship to that which you have experienced for yourself. Thomas knew that Thomas needed a testimony of his own. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to have a hand-me-down testimony. Oh, help me, pews. I said I wouldn't want to have a hand-me-down testimony. I want to have it for myself. Listen here, you can't tell me that he's a healer until he's healed you. Uh, you can't tell me that he's a savior until he saved you. You can't tell me what kind of way maker he is until you can tell me that he made a way for you. You cannot tell me that he lives until you can tell me that he lives in you. Thomas knew that even the testimony of 11 other folk would not be good enough. Thomas knew that praise predicated on anything other than personal experience is contrived it is contrived and artificial Thomas knew that praise that is based on what somebody else told you and not what you know for yourself is nothing but hearsay evidence and by the way whatever you do don't go preach somebody else's sermon Don't, don't, don't preach somebody else's sermon don't sing somebody else's song and don't shout on somebody else's testimony cause sooner or later you got to know the man for yourself 
I said sooner or later if you're going to preach you got to preach it for yourself if you're going to sing you got to sing it for yourself if you're going to shout you got to shout for yourself and all I'm trying to tell you is that passionate praise is always in relationship to my personal experience and I'll leave you alone today when I tell you that it only took a moment for Thomas to open his mouth in praise. And I know it doesn't look like it. It only looks like five words. My Lord and my God. But there's more here that is clouded by the inadequacies of human language. Here, here's what happened. The disciples had come to prayer meeting, but then Jesus came in. Listen to me. The disciples had gathered up for church. But then Jesus came in. You're not really paying attention. The disciples had gathered for business as usual on a Sabbath day, but then Jesus came in. A divine presence showed up. A herald from heaven knocked on the door. The Lamb of God showed up in the middle of their midst. The disciples came singing, but nobody was listening. The disciples were praying, but their prayers wasn't getting any higher than the ceiling. No doubt somebody among the disciples was probably preaching but they had no power for preaching until Jesus came in and here's all I need to tell you wherever you are whatever your circumstance no matter what your condition something happens whenever Jesus comes in somebody tell your neighbor that something happens whenever Jesus comes in even Thomas had to say that something happened when Jesus came in old Doubton Thomas had to give up his doubts when Jesus came came in questions went out the window and skepticism had no place when Jesus came in you can't have passionate praise until Jesus comes in now the thing that disturbs me however is that far too many of us have come to the point of passionless praise oh preacher don't say that you're gonna hurt somebody you're gonna step on somebody's feet well I don't care to move your feet then it disturbs me when I discover that there are some folk that come to church Sunday after Sunday and nothing ever gives them joy nothing ever puts fire in their mouth now help me Holy Ghost nothing ever puts running in their feet or clapping in their hands it's just passionless praise it's just going through the motions but that's all Thomas had just five little words uh, that's it five words maybe praise the Lord that's all you got but that's it maybe amen under the breath but never a hallelujah I'm talking about passionless praise going through the motion but no commotion passionless praise I'll just sit here until the noise is over and then I'll go home I'm talking about passionless praise Ah, I don't see how some folk do it. They come and folk will be shouting all around them and they sit there and look like a stick. Oh, but when like Thomas, when you've seen death face to face, I declare you will praise him. When you've seen your world upside down and then see it turn right side up, you will praise him. When the agents of hell are on your trail and the next cross is for you, I declare you will praise him. When the door of your heart is locked but he comes in anyhow, you will praise him. I'm talking about when everybody else has a testimony but then the day comes that you see him for yourself I declare it'll give you something to shout about when when just when you thought like Thomas that God had given up on you and then you discover that he came back just to see you I declare you will have some passionate praise when like Thomas you discover that Jesus is the Lord of your life I say when you discover that he's the Lord of your life the ruler of your life the owner of your life the possessor of your life the absolute ruler of your life you will praise him when you realize how much the Lord has done for you you can't keep it to yourself I said sooner or later you're gonna get up off your rusty dusty and praise him because you know that the Lord has been good 
good to you that the Lord has brought you a mighty long way that the Lord has opened doors for you that the Lord has raised up friends for you that the Lord has put food on your table and shoes on your feet and you got to you got to you got to praise him listen I'm not talking about praise for the sake of praise Ooh. I'm not talking about the kind of praise that is nothing more than spiritualized noise I'm not talking about praise that is all sound and no substance when there is a connection between who you are and the Christ of God in your life, it will give you a reason to praise. And whether you know it or not, I might as well go ahead and remind you today, whether you know it or not, we've got something to shout about. I'm standing here in the 10th month of the 8th year of the 21st century and I came by here to tell you we got something to shout about. We are the sons and daughters of God but we are also the sons and daughters of slavery. We are the sons and daughters of those that were beaten with whips and hunted by rabid dogs. We are the ones who had to read from books with pages torn out. We are the ones who had to go to inferior schools, but teachers loved us anyhow. We are the ones that they said would never count for nothing. But we are the ones who now have a brother. We have a brother that will take the blood of a black man and of a white woman and sit in our chairs our parents couldn't buy and live in a house they could never imagine. We got something to shout about. We got something to shout about. We are the begotten of the Father. Our names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Somebody said these are they that have come up out of great tribulation and have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. We got something to shout about. All because of Calvary. Salvation has been secured. Redemption's price has been paid. The ransom has been made. And sin which did abound, let grace abound all the more. Ain't that something to shout about? Ain't that something to shout about? Why don't you give God a little passionate praise? Why don't you just give God a little passionate praise? You're not ashamed to praise him, are you? So, I need you to help me preach five more minutes. Sit down, y'all worry me today. I need you to help me preach five more minutes. I don't know about you, but Metropolitan, when I come in here, I'm not coming in here for any mealy mouth praise. Somebody, somewhere, in between one or two of these pews, huh? in between one or two of these hardwood 
cushioned pews. Somebody in here ought to have some passionate praise. There, there ought to be something about which you are thoroughly passionate. There ought to be something that will make you stand on your feet when ain't nobody making you. There ought to be something that will put a song in your mouth. There ought to be something that will shake you down to your core. And if you can't say anything else, you at least ought to be able to say, My Lord and my God. Somebody can say, My Lord and my god somebody can say my lord and my god i thought i'd tell you today that there's power in your praise demons will flee when you praise satan can't stand it when you praise the imps of hell will leave you alone when you praise there's power in your praise yokes are broken when you praise strongholds come down when you praise the angels in heaven are singing when you praise the four and twenty elders say holy holy there's power in your praise somebody say power 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 yes I'm just going to quit right there. I can't stand no more myself. But I tell you what. There ought to be a reason to pray. Huh? So anybody in here need a reason to pray? Huh? If you don't need a reason to pray... Nobody need to beg you to pray. I don't have to prime the pump. <laughs> Y'all don't know what I'm talking about now. I said, but I don't need to prime the pump to get nobody to praise up in here. You hear what I'm talking about? But just in case, you need a reason to praise. I tell it all over the country, so I might as well tell it here. I got 10 reasons to praise. Can I tell you my reason? I said I got 10 reasons to pray. Can I tell you my reason? Why don't you stand on your feet? Because I want you to know my reason. There is a reason to praise. I'm going to do you like David Letterman. And I'm going to go from number 10 down to number 1. Can I tell you 10 reasons to praise? Well, reason number 10. He woke me up this morning. Reason number 9. He woke me up this morning. Reason number eight, he woke me up this morning. Reason number seven, he woke me up this morning. Reason number six, he woke me up this morning. Reason number five, he woke me up this morning. Reason number four, he woke me up this morning. Reason number three, he woke me up this morning. Reason number two, he woke me up this morning reason number one yeah he woke me up this morning say yeah say yeah say yeah say yeah say yeah say yeah yes praise him I love to praise him. I love to praise. 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 Wait, wait, come here. Let me get this. I love to praise him. I love to praise Him. I love to praise Him. I love to praise 
church is open. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sure. 